Welcome to today's webinar on nursing home case tips. Thank you for joining us today. I am Donna Jones. I am the president and director of associate and client experience here at Advocate Capital. This is a very uh, specialized area of the law, and we have two really outstanding experienced trial lawyers who specialize in nursing home cases. And with that, let's meet our guests. Um, so with us today is David Hoey of Hoey Law, uh, actually headquartered in North Reading, Massachusetts, which I think generally is a suburb of Boston. Um, David has focused his practice for 25 years on nursing nursing home cases. He has or holds the largest uh, nursing home wrongful death case in Massachusetts history, $14.5 million. Uh, he also, because he's worked in this industry for 25 years, um, has had the largest nursing home practice in the New England area generally. David, thank you for joining us today. You're welcome. It's good to see you. You as well. Also with us today, we're going to do coast to coast. So we have David Hoey in Boston or the Massachusetts area, and we have Kyle Schneeberg. Uh, his firm is called Bedsore Law, clearly his specialty. And uh, Kyle is located in Torrance, California, which is actually a suburb of Los Angeles generally. Um, Kyle has handled numerous uh, nursing home cases, you know, anything from $2,500 dollars to millions of dollars and actually um, has recovered over a hundred million dollars uh, for his clients in his practice time. Uh, he is an alumnus of the prestigious Trial Lawyers College founded by Jerry Spence and Kyle thank you for joining us today as well. Thank you Don I'm very happy to be here. Okay well, let's get to it. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping as we get started. Quick disclaimer that uh, anything you hear today, be sure and consult your own professionals. Uh, we're not here to give advice. We're here to share information and give you some tips from the two of the industry's leading experts. Very good. We're going to begin with uh, just a general discussion about types of nursing home cases. And Kyle, uh, would you like to get, get us started on some of these different types of nursing home cases and just a general commentary about your experience with those? Sure, I'd, I'd be happy to. Um, we see all kinds of different injuries in nursing homes. What, what I tell a lot of my, my peers in the injury uh, uh, litigation industry is that one of the challenges with nursing home injury cases is that, in my opinion, many of the uh, injuries that we see could be the the result of of the natural progression of a disease, for example. So, I mean, you can just because someone gets an infection in a nursing home doesn't mean that neglect occurred. Um, there are even circumstances where falls may happen, uh, it, but neglect did not occur. Um, unfortunately, the the industry, at least in California, where I practice, for the most part. Um, it is in such bad shape that we often find neglect when we pull back the curtains. Um, but uh, all these cases uh, take very different uh, uh, methods of workup. For example, uh, if we're looking at a fall case versus sexual assault or, or versus uh, malnutrition, dehydration, that they all um, are very different from a medical standpoint, from a workup standpoint. Okay, David, uh, in follow-up, what would you add uh, to Kyle's comments? Well, you know, the nursing home, the people residing in nursing homes, and then I use that residing, it's more of a residence than it is a hospital setting or patient setting. Now, you do have patients in a nursing home who then become residents. You know, it's a long-term care facility. These are where people live, okay? Um, they have medical ailments that need to be attended to, but it's a custodial care environment. And that's a nursing home's primary goal is to maintain a level of care and to, to maintain the resident's um, conditions, whatever they may be. And there's other facets. So there's doctors involved that are primary care or attending doctors to the residents and there's a medical director per facility by federal law so what i've been seeing is the types of claims that are now occurring 
this is right before COVID, but more apparent post COVID, is that these doctors, these primary care physicians and these medical directors aren't doing their job. And they're relying too much on the custodial care givers. Um, there's enough things out there that puts the physician or nurse practitioner, if they're using one, or the medical director on alert that there's a problem within the facility and they have an obligation to do something and they're just not doing it. Uh, and we're in a day and age now where nursing homes are running without insurance and those states in which they can, they don't have to have insurance as a requirement and are self-insured. Um, if you're gonna pursue one of these cases on the plaintiff side, you have to look at the other caregivers in the story to determine um, what, if anything, they knew, or what, if anything, <laughs> they should have known that they didn't know. Uh, the medical director is the key, though, I'm finding lately. Uh, they know if it's a bad facility or it's a good facility. Um, they know if the staff are meeting all the needs of the residents in the building or not. And are they just sitting on their hands? Or are they actively participating as a medical director? So I'm seeing a shift in the type of claims and the type of caregivers that have exposure. Okay, uh, very interesting and, and thank you. And that, that's a good segue into our next topic, David. Uh, you mentioned COVID and uh, in preparing for our discussion today, uh, we did just a, a little bit of research and, and found um, some interesting statistics. Uh, let's see, in 2020, the U.S. decided to pause routine nursing home inspections. We also saw 38 states grant immunity to nursing home owners under the new laws passed. And David, I know you've, you've written a paper on this and you're um, very well informed about the impact and, and you mentioned the post-COVID era. So I guess, what would you say generally about how what you see in the impact of nursing homes from COVID? A couple things. Uh, I am one of those states where they passed immunity during the COVID Part, uh, during the, the COVID timeframe, um, that immunity has been now released. But here's what, here's what, I'll just use Massachusetts as an example, but this is on a national level. Um, Massachusetts had almost 400 nursing homes pre-COVID. As a result of COVID, we're down to about 200 nursing homes. So we lost almost 100 nursing homes because of it. We've had well over 3,000 deaths just in the nursing home setting related to COVID issues. The nursing home industry lost 24,000 caregivers, not so much because of death, but because they can't work in the industry anymore or they did get COVID or they did die. Um, so those nursing homes that survived this COVID mess, I give credit to. And to take a case, a COVID case, let's say, and put it before a jury, that jury is going to have great sympathy for the nursing homes that survived the COVID pandemic. Even though they're not supposed to consider sympathy in their verdict, it's a human element. They're going to, they're going to suffer. They're going to use their sympathy and empathy. But here, here's the core difference that I've seen and why I'm reluctant to take cases during the COVID period or post COVID right now. Prior to COVID, the nursing home operators, the, primarily the owners and the management companies of these nursing homes would siphon so much money out of the nursing home that the nursing home didn't have enough money, resources and supplies to meet all the needs of the residents. Well, post COVID, I'm finding the reverse. I'm finding that these owners and management companies are now investing in the nursing home and pouring money into the nursing home so that the nursing home can survive. Wow. So I, I, it's a big shift and it's a big difference in how we're eventually going to have to take depositions in the case. Now, because they're investing more money into the nursing home and 
more management services into the nursing home so that the nursing home can survive post COVID because of all the losses that occurred during COVID and neglect then still occurs. I actually think you got a stronger case. Yeah. Um, so that's, and, and, and be, keep it mindful that, that the pandemic is still here. Mm -hmm. COVID is still occurring. And there's still hot pockets all over the country. And nursing home people are the most vulnerable. And if they get it, you know, chances are it's, it can be life threatening. So that's that's where I'm at with that COVID issue. Okay, thank you, uh, Kyle. Would has your experience been similar to what David just shared, or how is it different in California where you practice? Well, we're fortunate. We don't have an immunity in California. Um, we did have waivers uh, of the staffing requirements, but that does not affect our ability to go in and, and still get after these facilities if they failed. You know, one of the most interesting um, uh, pieces of information I've picked up during this pandemic is a, a good friend of mine's on the board of a nonprofit uh, skilled nursing facility. And, and they've been well regarded for several years. They have an incredibly long waiting list to get into that facility because everybody knows their reputation. And he is, uh, he's also very well regarded uh, academic in the field. He is of the opinion that if things were done properly, if, if uh, interventions and protections and precautions were handled properly, that the effect of COVID was very low in the homes that's not to say that there wasn't an effect, but when we see these homes that have these explosions in the infection rates or explosions in the amount of deaths, um, he's convinced that, that that was avoidable. And the data for years has shown and has continually reaffirmed. Uh, one of the, the foremost uh, experts in this area is Charlene Harrington out of uh, UCSF. Um, she's repeatedly pointed out that the data supports that for-profit and private equity uh, owned facilities provide much poorer quality of care than the nonprofits. And so we're, we're kind of seeing that in uh, the comparison of some of the nonprofits now. Um, California, from what I've seen in the public data, really shifted to uh, looking at mitigation plans during COVID. Uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, deficiencies and um, findings related to failures to to carry out proper infection protocols. I, I personally, um, I, I, I've been in this industry about 15 years uh, as an attorney. And my take is that these homes ran on such thin margins uh, with staff at the beginning of the pandemic that they were not prepared for this. So I, while I, I completely sympathize with the effect of the pandemic on everyone's business, including skilled nursing homes, um, I do believe it's a little disingenuous, the amount of the blame, blame being put on COVID. Um, I, I think a lot of these private homes could have done a lot better. And what's really interesting in preparing for this uh, webinar today, I did find some studies, including a May 2021 study that actually said staffing ratios improved because while uh, uh, staffing numbers dropped, uh, the, the patient levels dropped too, one way or another. Um, uh, anecdotally, a colleague of mine who's a radiologist said at the beginning of the pandemic, they were seeing a huge decline in uh, ER reporting of things like heart attacks and non-elective issues, which they found extremely odd because people are gonna still have heart attacks presumably at the same rate uh, even during a pandemic, but what, what was expected uh, or what was believed is that people just weren't going to the ER as much or weren't reporting as much. So I, I think there may have been a tapering off of the skilled admissions due to the pandemic for fear of it, um, but it's unclear because there are, are also studies that show that the uh, ratios went down. So it's, it's really unclear whether uh, ratios went up or down in the first year of the pandemic. 
Okay. And in that same, I guess, arena, uh, talking about the COVID impact on the nursing home industry, just a couple of, of quick follow-up questions. Um, you know, so now what is there to protect patients from nursing homes, um, you know, not ensuring that COVID procedures are, you know, followed uh, and providing adequate protection. And with that, as trial lawyers, you know, how do you feel about how justice can be delivered uh, for these residents of the nursing home? David, we'll, we'll start back with you again. Oh, gee. Um, well, there's always been protections in place and one of those protections is they have to have infection control policies procedures infection control measures and all that stuff and, and i agree with kyle and uh, most of these covid cases um, were avoidable right uh, especially when you have a nursing home that has like 35 deaths uh, because covid spread so fast through there and, um, the problem i have with that is I'm in that state where immunity took place, and I'm in that same state that had the 35 deaths in a life care center of America. The National Guard had to come in and 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 surround the building and protect it. So, wow. but the government stepped in and took away the protection to the elderly. Okay, exactly. Um, but the protective measures that were in place prior to COVID still exist. There's now a higher um, uh, awareness that those protective shields exist. They just need to be implemented and then they need to be enforced. And the enforcement comes in two ways. Your, your State Department of Public Health doing their yearly surveys and investigations, they need to hurt them when something bad has happened and the other way is through lawyers like kyle and myself and about 300 400 other ones around the country that concentrate in this area of, of law you got to hold them accountable and you got to take them to the verdicts um hold, have a jury held them accountable and fight these arbitration clauses which are taking uh, rights away from elderly people in nursing homes and but the protective shields are there. They've always been there. They just need to be used more and enforced more. One way to enforce them is a court court of law. Absolutely. Kyle, any any follow up or, or additional thoughts about kind of the, those two questions from your perspective in California? Yeah, enforcement is really tricky. Um, I have a very low opinion of it in California. I mean, my heart goes out to the regulators who are trying to do their job and hold facilities accountable. But time and again, we just see uh, astonishing outcomes where, you know, the facts are clear as day and either uh, the, the complaint is unsubstantiated by the, the uh, state surveyor or they substantiate it, but they don't award any penalty. It, it, you know, they give what's called a deficiency, which is really just a a finding that, hey, you guys screwed this up. Uh, a significant penalty in California is probably about $25,000. So for a home that, you know, makes a million dollars in profit, 25,000 is, I guess, a cost of doing business. And, and, I, and I say this as a former nursing home defense attorney a long time ago in my career. On the immunity issue, you know, um, that's a tough issue, extremely risky. I, I do wanna give a, a big shout out to my partner, Ernie Tosh who's a longtime elder abuse litigator. He has recently found some success in North Carolina, uh, convincing, I believe it was a trial court, not the appellate level, but a trial court. It may have been the appellate level, so I, I gotta be careful. Uh, but, but one of the other, uh, that the immunity was a affirmative defense rather than a bar to litigation. So if anybody out there is dealing with immunity issues in North Carolina or any other state for that matter, I would encourage you to reach out to uh, Ernie Tosh, uh, to my firm, and we'll connect you, and he can let you know uh, the, the strategy that they were able to, to navigate that. Um, in, in California, uh, infection cases have, oh, I, I, anywhere, an infection case is gonna be tough. It, it's really tough. Um, to add on to, to David's points, uh, I've taken very few true COVID infection cases. Um, as a trial attorney, my fear is, is not so much proving where the infection came from, which is extremely challenging, but this is an issue that has been so politicized in our country 
that I'm not sure anyone out there can get a, a jury uh, who, who's not going to politicize that that case if you're trying to prove a, a failure of infection protocols without just incredibly compelling evidence. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, you, you both touched on our next topic, and so uh, we'll move into that. Uh, the, the issues uh, with the healthcare and the and the understaffing in these facilities. And so, again, just a, a quick statistic that we ran into in our research indicated that according to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services at Harvard, uh, it's estimated that 50 percent, 50 percent of nursing homes are understaffed. Um, do you see case or I guess litigation or cases? Um, suing facilities for intentionally understaffing for you know the purpose of maximizing profit i think we all know that's uh what what the game is here uh david in, any comment on that understaffing issue uh, uh, yeah so that has been the profit over people understaffing intentional understaffing intentional understaffing conscious corporate conscious decisions to understaff or under supplier or under resource a nursing home for the personal uh, or corporate gain of money and um, it also differs by state by state so california and i'll let kyle talk about california in a moment they have a great staffing uh, uh, statutes as well as some great staffing cases that came out of california which made some national attention and I th still think there's some more cooking around out there. In Massachusetts, we don't have the staffing numbers per se. We have nursing home must have sufficient staff to meet all the needs of the residents. And that sufficient staff issue is determined by the nursing home itself. Uh, they got to they gotta do it uh, according to the needs of, of the residents. Other states have, you have to have so many RN hours per patient. You have to have so many CNA hours per patient. And if they're not meeting those numbers, that could be a cause of, act, of action in that state. I mean, California is one of the best at it. Um, when I do have to determine numbers, I call my good friend Ernie Tosh. Like Kyle <laughs> said, get me the data on this particular facility or this particular company. And when I do do an understaffing case, like, for example, a, a national chain, Genesis, Healthcare, or Life Care Centers of America, or when Kindred Healthcare was around, they're no longer around. Um, I would ask to have the numbers. Like Kindred had 42 nursing homes in Massachusetts at one time. I get the status on all 42, not just the nursing home where my client was neglected or injured. And I, uh, I would march forward with all that data. Um, but yeah, under, the first thing you look at is what was the root cause of what happened here? Was it understaffing? I mean, the, the standard of care, if you want to have to use those buzzwords, and like the state of New York, I have to use those buzzwords, is it's simple, right? One, you meet the, the, the requirements of the Code of Federal Regulation. Two, you meet the requirements of your state regulations. Three, you follow your policies and procedures, which are also required by the requirements in the state or federal government. Um, you follow physicians' orders. Okay, that's pretty much it. That's what you got to do. How you go about doing it is the other issue. And how do you do it? How do you comply? Through staff. And if you don't have the staff to meet those four or five requirements, then there's a problem. That's what the root cause is. It, uh, but it yeah. seems pretty simple, doesn't it? <laughs> As a lot of a lot of these issues are. Um, Kyle, he mentioned um, the the difference in the law and and that California is is much more, I guess, favorable. Uh, we would say. Would you like to add a commentary on that? Sure. Uh, in California, until 2018, we'd had 3.2 uh, per patient day staffing ratio, meaning uh, for every you know, 100 patients, you had to have 3.2 staff hours. Um, it moved uh, in 2018 to 3.5 and they added a requirement, the 
of that 3.5 has got to come from certified nursing assistants with the intent that a lot of the uh, hygiene and neglect was the result of not enough aides being there to do transfers to uh, keep their eyes on everything. Um, you know, the reason why staffing is such a hot issue in nursing home is that, again, the research correlates uh, quality of care to the number of staff. And it's really the number. I mean, quality matters, but but research has shown that it's the number. If you just don't have enough people, you're going to get more frequent bad outcomes. Uh, from a legal standpoint, it, it's a compelling argument. I think profits over people is always... A, a very a significant betrayal by someone who agrees to provide care to a loved one, an elderly vulnerable person, and then fleeces them. You know, they're getting paid a ton of money to do this, uh, government money for the most part, and then they uh, warehouse them and, and uh, it, it cause tragic injuries. From a legal standpoint, it's very compelling because it's one of the only ways we can have some black and white evidence about whether or not there was a breach of the duty to take care of folks. So um, we get into the numbers. Uh, there, there's uh, the federal government started releasing payroll data uh, a handful of years ago, and um, we're able to get very accurate numbers compared to before on how many staff were on duty. And I, I'll tell you, 10 years ago, um, in my opinion, in California, the staffing usually was above the minimum. Now, the minimum is just the minimum. You're never supposed to go under the minimum, no matter how healthy or ill your residents are. Um, and then there's another uh, statute that requires the facility to meet the needs. So maybe the minimum would meet the me needs, maybe it wouldn't. The, you know, the research shows that the minimum rarely, if ever, meets the needs. But um, there's sort of two parts of the same, uh, two sides of the same coin. But um, what what the staffing really allows us to do is look at the trends and the trend 10 years ago uh, i'd rarely see a violation of the minimum which admittedly was 3.2 but now i'm seeing so many violations over the last three or four years and i i hold enforcement responsible for that because i can look up staffing for the last five years on any facility right now and it's shocking to me that the uh, state surveyors are not acknowledging this. I mean, the data is right there. <laughs> they, they can see who's properly staffing, who isn't. And yet um, you will rarely, rarely see uh, a staffing uh, a deficiency in California, in my opinion. Okay, a quick follow-up question. And, and maybe um, I'm, I'm thinking of this and, and approaching it from a different angle. And so in your experience, in these cases that you've litigated against nursing homes, is there ever a practice whereby the facility can manipulate their financial records to make them appear not profitable so that they can, you know, hedge that staffing requirement? Does that make sense, David? Yeah, I mean, there's, uh, this is how, this is what happens, right? They're faced with a staffing requirement either issued by federal or state law or industry standards also call for a staffing level. And then there's a board of directors meeting or there's a meeting with the administrator and there's a meeting with other powers to be and they have a budget and they figure out whether they could afford it to meet the numbers or not and, and still make a profit along with all the other overhead that it caused it requires and then they make a conscious decision to either not meet those numbers so they can make make a profit or to meet the numbers the defense that they've been using is they've used their best efforts and in using their best efforts they've they've done the best they could to comply with the statute where the statute doesn't allow them to comply because then nursing home would never make any money doesn't go too too far but you got to go back to the layers to the decisions that are being generated um it's it, that's where it starts to get a little complex and you may never know the answers that's where whistleblowers come in the, come into play that's how come a lot of these understaffing cases originate from a whistleblower than some bean counter 
And I don't mean that to the Ernie Tosh is a bean counter. He's a hell of a lot more than that. But yeah, it's 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 all about decisions. All right, Kyle. Any any follow up before we leave this topic? Yes, um, <clears throat> we do have some uh, uh, significant financial transparency in the form of uh, these cost reports that the facilities must file, and they're they're pretty detailed. Um, the challenge is that many of the the private equity uh, facilities are owned by large organizations. Those organizations are clearly involved in operations because they want to make sure that they're running profitably. Um, but but someone must have invented a playbook 20 years ago. I've heard it was Manor Care uh, <laughs> to manipulate the way these homes do the reporting, how they uh, manipulate the numbers, how they tweak everything. Um, I was shocked uh, as a defense attorney in California for a, a large chain, and then I, I um, and so I saw how they ran. I went back east uh, as a defense attorney for a chain in Florida, uh, Tennessee, Kentucky, West Virginia, and the playbook was like identical. I mean, it was a completely separate company. So, so at some point, they learned this sort of tactic of hiding the numbers. Um, so even though there is some transparency, uh, we're still fighting for more. My, my partner, again, Ernie Tosh, who's very knowledgeable in this area. He's kind of made himself an expert on staffing. He's been involved uh, uh, lobbying Congress for better transparency of the relationships between the management companies and the uh, um, facilities. I mean, we routinely see agreements between the management company and the facility that are designed to create the appearance that the management company has been divested of any control. You know, they only provide uh, accounting consultation and website support, et cetera. But it's it's all smoke and mirrors. You know, recently uh, we, we've got a case with Genesis Healthcare, which I understand is the largest chain in the country by revenue. Um, and even though they've got all these uh, illusory, uh, uh, misleading uh, uh, management agreements, you go look at their 10K, which they've got, you know, under the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, they've got to represent uh, uh, under certification penalty perjury to the federal government. And suddenly they're talking about how they operate all these local facilities, which completely contradicts the language in the agreement that, by the way, is often signed by the same person. <laughs> that oh my. Is often signed by the same person on behalf of the facility and the management company. So there, there's a lot of shenanigans that go on. Um, but it, to be fair, it, it's it's very effective. It makes it very hard for us to get through uh, to the, the truth. And unfortunately, I, I don't know why this is. I have run into so many judges who um, play the defense's game, and it's it's shocking to me. But um, it, it is a very effective strategy, and, and for that reason, I'm not sure it will change anytime soon. Kyle has hit the nail right on the head there. You know, it, was, it, was, it was Beverly Enterprises that you were wondering about um the corporate family tree as i call it and as i usually put it up on the board with arrows pointing to direction and control and all that kind of stuff flow of money and all that kind of stuff um about 94 95 percent of the judges uh did never practiced in the civil arena trial work or nursing home abuse and neglect cases on either side of the v so when you put issues like this before uh judges who have never been exposed to this th these type of issues and these had types of decisions that they need to make vent joint venture right um they don't know what to do with it and it's easier to ignore it than it is to address it. And it's taken me, it had to be at least 20 years before I was able to get some courts to recognize and say, ah, hmm, I see what you're saying. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a key. Now, federal court, some cases in federal court, the federal judges, they roll up their sleeves and they're like, okay, let's figure out what's going on here. Yeah. Okay. Holding company, holding company, my ass. 
<laughs> and, uh, but you don't get that same and you don't get that same treatment in the, in the state courts. Mm. Okay, so we're back to that old adage, you know, I've, I've heard that all my life. Well, why are you making a federal case out of it? And so there is a substantive difference in, well, probably not just nursing home cases, but all cases uh, handled at the federal court level versus the state court level. Um, Kyle, would you agree with that generally? You know, federal practice is very different than uh, state, at least in California. Um, some states uh, sort of run their, their uh state procedures similar to federal ours are different um i found federal judge so again maybe this is a california issue uh, a lot of these judges deal with just gigantic cases i mean you get into some of the business disputes we're talking hundreds of millions billions of dollars so um i felt like a pretty little fish at times and uh my experience in federal has been that similar to state a lot of these judges are just looking to move a case off their docket and 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 they're trying to expedite so i'm not a fan of federal court in california um it, 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 it's at the judge's discretion but we can get extensive uh, voir dire time which is really key from a trial lawyer standpoint but in federal you get no uh voir dire uh you can need a unanimous jury i mean it's an extremely high burden to overcome it, it, in what's already extremely challenging environment for for these cases okay no, no, i agree with that if you can avoid federal court avoid federal court yeah the, the quality of judge i agree with david it's it's much higher and um if you can get their attention it, it can be more effective but uh there are a lot of challenges in federal that yeah Just, yeah no it's not worth it okay well, let's move on to our next topic. And I think if you ask the average American about nursing home litigation or cases, they think about uh, patient harm. And so again, just a, just a quick statistic, uh, according to the U.S. Health Department and Human Services, one third of Medicare beneficiaries, one third, report suffering harm within two weeks of their arrival at one of these facilities. David, does that sound about the norm to you? I don't know. I'd have to think about that and look at that. I could tell you from my experience, a majority of my cases, something happened within the first month. Okay. And, and one of my very first verdicts was um, in, the, in the late 90s or mid 90s. Um, was a person was only there for about five hours. You know, they, wow. they just left the mission day. They just left left the person in the foyer area. The room wasn't ready. They weren't ready for the person. The person decided to try to get up, use the restroom, fell, broke uh, broke his hip. You know, the, the short little two hundred twenty eight thousand dollar verdict. But the point was, there's a lot of um they don't know the resident yet they don't know the resident's needs yet they're still in the care planning stage uh family still trying to visit all the time uh new doctors now assigned to this person yeah i would say if i looked at all my cases and you're talking thousands there's a there's a high percentage of them that occurred within the first month wow kyle is that your experience as well you know, Donna, that's an interesting statistic that I, I've never heard before, and I appreciate it. Um, it, it is it is overall my experience. I'm going to tell you, I have a theory about this and, and why this may be. Um, and now hearing the statistic, I, I feel like it's a little more solid. Uh, these are cookie cutter models. I mean, in, any any really successful business is going to run a big hierarchy with as many people at the bottom uh, to make money for the company because that's just how business works labor is typically the the most expensive part of any business and it's been my opinion that um, these are cookie cutter systems and for people who don't fit into that system who need uh, who are higher acuity whether because they have dementia or a very serious uh, uh, issue that doesn't allow them to walk very well or they have significant needs for bed mobility um, they're the ones who are affected. So it, it, I have seen some extremely long care cases where uh, long-term care, where you've got someone in there for a year or 18 months 
but it seems to be the exception. It's the folks who come in, have very high needs. And, and yes, I, I've seen several cases where two to five days, you know, we've got a very serious injury. A uh, case recently, 18 hours in, the doctor inexplicably canceled a 72-hour um, uh, one-to-one supervision. Uh, nobody could say why she did it. And a uh, half hour after the, the assistant who was supervising left, the woman fell and shattered her hip. The, the residents. So um, it, it's issues like this. So it's it's almost, yeah, if, if someone makes it through 30 to 60 days of long-term care, then their odds of not being injured until they have a very significant change of condition are probably pretty good. Okay. You, you both mentioned uh, fall type injuries, uh, hip fractures, those sorts of things. Uh, that was actually going to be my next question. Is there a, a particular injury or type of injury that you see most often? And uh, in that uh, instance, is there um, a particular way that you go about proving that it was the facility's error that that fall or that injury occurred? David? Well, I've been doing this for a long time, so I've seen trends. I, uh, I'll do it this way. So when I first started, there was a, a lot of pressure ulcer cases, you know, sometimes commonly known as bed sores, decubitus ulcers. There was a lot of pressure ulcer cases, so I was pursuing pressure ulcer cases. Then the industry cleaned up its act, and I didn't see many more pressure ulcer cases, but then I started to see a lot of falls and fracture cases and head trauma cases. And then five, six years go by of that. And then they clean up their act on being fall awareness and fall protocols and better care planning and all that kind of stuff. Then the bed sores resurface or the dehydration or the malnutrition cases or, or the deformity. I mean, it comes in trends, but it all boils down to one thing, quality and quantity of staff supervision and training of staff. Um, it's just, it's the nature of, of these cookie cutters, the way they're designed and the way they're operated, that's what happens. They come in these trends and they come in these waves. Uh, there was choking cases for a while. I started having a lot of choking cases. Early on, I used to have a lot of the bed rail death cases, but then the industry, uh, the manufacturers of bed rails, so the, the bed rail had to be compatible with the mattress, you know, and they were getting mixed and matched and stuff, and people would get caught in there. I, I don't, I, I haven't seen a bed rail case in, in years because that, that area has improved so much. Elopement, wandering away from the facility. I used to see a lot of those cases were in a, in a, in a certain wave. I don't see many of those anymore because the technology got better and keeping them in the building, those that that, that wander away. Um, so yeah, it 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 goes and it comes and goes in certain waves. We still so currently the majority of calls. So we we have well over five hundred intakes a year. You know, um, I would say the majority are fall related. Currently, okay. That's fair enough. I'm going to take a quick pause, Kyle, and then I'll come back to you. We um, have uh, an attendee who submitted a question. Uh, do you find a lot of medication industries injuries? Excuse me. Um, Kyle, you want to start on that one? Sure. Um, in my opinion, medication injuries as a direct result, like the wrong medication, wrong dosage, in my, in my experience, those are pretty rare. What we do see are injuries from the side effects. You know, what was, if somebody fell three times, what kind of medications were they on? And after the first or second fall, and, and, and sort of to, to veer into what David was addressing, one of the reasons that staffing is so important and, and the quality and especially the number is that what a nursing home is really supposed to do is number one, assess. So, well, even before that, implement the incoming orders from the prior physician or prior providers, and then assess and find out what does this person need. And then if there are uh, negative outcomes, so if somebody has a fall, and we see this time and again, 
um, just because somebody has a fall, obviously they, they don't have an immediate injury. You know, sometimes they they have no uh, apparent injury. They may have a laceration, a bruise. Um, wh wh when a fall case really uh, becomes powerful from an evidentiary standpoint is if somebody falls two or three or four times in the first two or three times, they didn't have a significant injury. What did that facility do to try to prevent a recurrence? And it's been my experience that we don't see uh, much in the way of new interventions or, or even if interventions were recommended, they weren't implemented, uh, they're not timely. So that's the question. Did, did they continually update their assessment and interventions and implement them and try to prevent that? Because if they did, that, that's gonna be a very tough neglect claim. Uh, from a medication standpoint, um, one of the things everyone uh, who's who's litigating this area needs to do, if they don't already know this, is read Title 42 of the federal regulations. I, I've been told uh, that this industry is one of the most regulated, possibly second only to the aerospace industry, because there are so many requirements on these homes. And while it's onerous, the reason we do that is because uh, of, of, the, of the vulnerability of the people involved. But what I'm getting at is um, chances are you're gonna find a violation. So for example, was somebody put on a, um, a, a regimen to wean them off a certain medication that may cause lethargy or uh, dizziness, et cetera? And did they try and do that? You know, did they actually get this person to a physician to reduce and evaluate and attempt? A bowel and bladder training is another one. If someone's on a catheter, did they actively try to get them off the catheter? Because we know a catheter uh, substantially increases the risk of infection. So what I would propose is that does a medication error happen where, you know, someone gives uh, 500 milligrams instead of 50 and then someone overdoses or has a stroke? It, it can happen. But um, what are much more common are, are uh, bad outcomes related to medications that either shouldn't have been uh, ordered, shouldn't have been uh, um, uh, continued indefinitely or weren't reassessed, et cetera. And, and by the way, on that point, a good um, medical legal review before filing or, or right after filing, depending on your statute of limitations issue, uh, it's worth its weight in gold because a, a good reviewer will turn up a lot of these issues. Okay. David, your thoughts on the uh, medication injury question? Yeah, no, I, I agree with, with Kyle. Although medication uh, errors occur, they occur a lot, but they all don't end up leading to a, a significant uh, problem with a resident. I mean, you, you read about or you heard about the morphine over there, giving the morphine to the wrong resident or, or a certain other wrong medication or a resident not getting his or her stroke medication, and then as a result, they stroked out. You know, um, it, it, it does occur. Anything related to medication, um, the side effects are, are key, and the nursing staff need to administer through a physician's order the medication. Then there's a time in which they're supposed to come back and see if the medication is working. That's the assessment. And then they need to report back to the doctor if it is or isn't, the medication order is or isn't, isn't working. Um, I tell you where I do see a medication issue. And, and we just tried this case last August. August will be one year we tried a case where the pain medication for a resident in chronic pain was uh, being stolen for three and a half years by, oh my two, stars. by two caregivers so this resident was without pain medication for three and a half years and other staff kept reporting and and these these two caregivers were reporting to the doctor the pain medication is not working given her the pain she's still in pain she's still screaming out in pain doctor would come and assess and can't understand why the pain medication is not working because according to the chart she's getting her pain medication and the doctor would up the pain meds and these two these two would go and steal the pain meds over and over and over again so i had to bring the case against um, not just the two that stole the pain meds but the um 
facility for not supervising these two and not having safety protocol in place. Medications are highly under lock and key and there's a, there's a log that needs to be filled in. And I mean, it's, it's very sensitive pain medication, particularly narcotic, but very, very regulated and controlled. And these two were able to get away with it for three and a half years. Um, so, and I've learned that the stealing of medications, all kinds of medications, but particularly pain medication is rampant. Hmm. And, and if they get access to the medication, they're going to take it. There's a black market on it. There's self-use. And this is something that's well known. And the U.S. Department of Justice puts out warnings and alerts to the nursing home industry constantly that staff will steal meds. And you've got to be on it. So that's where I see the medication cases. Okay, we have another uh, question from an attendee. How about failure to follow lab results? Uh-huh. Yeah, that's, that's a big one. Um, is it? Yeah. And especially in the context of, uh, of like a urinary tract infection, t- time is of the essence, you know, getting antibiotics ordered. Um, I, I've seen that several times. Uh, you got to be really careful and make sure you subpoena the lab results from the the lab company. Um, it, it's it's very common for results not to get reported timely or at all. Uh, the physicians in skilled nursing respectfully uh, tend to phone it in a little more from what I've seen compared to a hospital, for example. Um, so you you can't rely on the physician following up if they were notified of an infection. So yeah, that, that's absolutely a, um, a ripe area for litigation. Okay. And I've, had, I've had those cases. I mean, I've had them and, they're, and, and the ones I've had have been close to holidays. Wow. Um, lab report came in the Tuesday before Thanksgiving break. I call it Thanksgiving break, but there is no break in care, right? It right. comes in the, the Tuesday before Thanksgiving. It didn't, it came in on a fax. It didn't get picked up or read until Sunday after Thanksgiving. And by that time, the UTI was out of control, didn't get the proper antibiotics, and she died of uh, urosepsis. Um, wow. Was against Kindred. So, that's where I saw problems when well, they used to be faxed. Now they're emailed. Right. They can, they can sit in somebody's email box for three or four days. Mm. So, yeah, the, the, the lab report issue or the lab report comes in and it shows an infection and then they don't tell the doctor. So the doctor doesn't have an opportunity to prescribe the medicine, even though the doctor is supposed to be copied on the on the lab result. It's just communication. Yes. Yes. We have a, a couple of topics left and I, I want to be respectful of your time. We're, we're coming to the to the near the end of our hour, but we did have one additional question and I'd I'd like to um, take that one quickly. Um, oh. Okay, never mind. We're going to handle that offline. Uh, so the last two topics I had, and 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 Kyle, I know you want to speak to the micro law, um, David. What do you see on the horizon? Are there efforts to improve um, the facility with regard? To, I don't know. I think about tort reform. It's not really that, but just reform for the industry. Period. Do you see any movement with that? There's always movement on that, and it's usually advocate groups. Uh, Massachusetts Advocates for Nursing Home Reform. California has a massive advocate. California, I forget what the full name is, might be Advocates for Nursing Home Reform. Uh, Canner, uh, yeah. Yeah, Canner, right? Um, they have always been instrumental in the state and uh, federal level, uh, national level on this, and they continue to make these efforts, but they are a low voice. Unfortunately, the industry has a loud voice. And my politics are politics, but um, 
it just doesn't always seem to be the highest priority on the political list. You know, okay. certain attorney generals, I should say, like the Massachusetts attorney general who's running for election for governor is now pursuing cases against the nursing homes. You know? um, and other other AG's offices are, are, are doing that. One of the one of the best litigators in the business, David Marks, out of uh, Houston, Texas, started in the AG's office, and his job was prosecuting nursing homes for all sorts of stuff. That's where he got his start. So I think the power is going to be with the attorney general's offices of each state um, enforcing their nursing home laws per state. But yeah, there's always an effort, always an effort. Just it's not a loud enough voice, unfortunately. Okay. Hmm. Kyle, we'll, we'll change gears a little bit and uh, let you share um, with our attendees about the micro law in California. Yeah, California um, kind of out of nowhere has made some incredible reforms recently uh, for the first time in our state's history that I'm aware of. Uh, over 150 years of jurisprudence, they uh, legislated in beginning in 2022 that pre-death pain and suffering damages would be allowed. I know those have been allowed in some other states, but before uh, 2022, you could not get pre-death pain and suffering uh, for for a, uh, a case in California, which is, although we have an elder abuse statute, which uh, cap pre-death pain and suffering at 250, it, it's tricky if you've got an elder client who then passes and the difference is, is that now there's exposure from a negligence, you know, simple uh, uh, burden of proof, uh, whereas an elder abuse, it's a very high burden of proof in California to uh, previously to access pre-death pain and suffering. But among the reforms, um, it's, it's shocking that MICRA, which is the uh, Medical Injury Compensation Reform Act that protects healthcare providers, uh, a, an agreement was reached in April uh, of this year, 2022. And um, that law was, I believe, I want to say about 45 years old. It was legislated in 1975. It had not changed from 250,000 on uh, a cap on damages in almost 50 years. And wow. um, many people were instrumental in this, but but the, the tip of it was my former employer, Nicholas Rowley, who's a phenomenal national trial attorney. He spearheaded this whole thing and managed to, to pull it off. And, and what it does is it lifts the cap from 250 to 350 on a straightforward medical negligence case or 500 if it's a wrongful death case. And then there are provisions where if there are more tort feasors, uh, it can actually go up and it will continue to increase in the future. Um, interestingly, our elder abuse statute is tied to that. So, so now our pre-death pain and suffering damages under elder abuse uh, actually increase with it. So um, th this is, very relevant because the exposure is increasing for the defendants in California. And um, I would propose that California, although not always, has set the tone for reforms across the nation. Um, and, and I think we're going to see this. I know uh, Nick Rally tries cases all over the country. He's uh, uh, started out as a med mal attorney, he does almost any injury now, and he's really energized to try and uh, lift caps or increase caps in other states now as well. The reason why this is so key is that uh, due to the labor market and inflation, uh, these nursing homes are getting into worse situations while their exposure is increasing. And while I sympathize for the challenges in the healthcare business, uh, it's been shocking to me that the skilled nursing lobby, I mean, we're talking about a, I, I don't have the number off the top of my head, but I, I believe Genesis uh, is a $40 billion a year company, and that's just one national chain. So we're talking hundreds of billions in revenue a year, and yet they, the, to my knowledge, they're doing nothing in terms of lobbying the federal government to cr increase reimbursement rates significantly to um, improve quality and number of staff. It, it's bizarre to me. They're, they're, as far as I can tell, they're sitting on their hands. So uh, the, the crossroads that we're gonna come to is much more significant exposure, at least in California, probably elsewhere, uh, and much worse care and uh, much more frequent injuries in other uh, in, in all these facilities across the nation. So some states are rolling it back. I did read that Florida, I believe, is trying to decrease staffing levels, which is 
not the right way to do this. It's it's only going to lead to further injury. But um, they're still going to get sued. I mean, even if your minimum staffing level is lower, juries are still going to see through that and and hold these places responsible, in my opinion. Agreed. Um, I always think of um, a, a phrase that I heard, you know, we owe the greatest generation so much more in terms of the care, the level of care that they receive in these facilities. And regardless of the generation, um, we, we do owe them better. And, and I just want to say a personal thank you to you both. Uh, the work you do is so important and so critical. Um, you know, that's that's great news about the micro law. And, and I agree, Kyle, I, I hope that California does uh, start a new trend and, and move the rest of the country in a better direction. Um, we're, we're out of time. And so I did want to let everyone know, in case you didn't see it in the chat, that we will um, um, address all the other questions presented offline and make sure you get uh, the information you need or get your questions answered. Uh, if you live in the New England area or if you live anywhere, uh, actually, and you'd like to, you know, speak with David Hoey, refer him a case. If you, you think you have a potential case, uh, we have his contact information here for you on the screen. David, do you prefer phone, email, or does it matter? It, it doesn't matter. I mean I've been all over this great country. I've flown and flown to wherever I need to fly, or been to wherever I need to be. So, whatever's whatever's easy. Okay, awesome, and thank you for that. And likewise, if you're on the West Coast or wherever you are, uh, I think Kyle probably shares the same sentiment in that, you know, it is his goal to pursue all these cases vigorously, regardless of, of where they are. And this is Kyle's contact information on the screen now. Kyle, any preference on how someone might like to reach out to you, uh, phone, email, potential case referrals? Either way is fine. I'm probably an email electronic person. Um, and, and if people have questions about that immunity statute, I really encourage you to reach out and and uh, we'll connect you with Ernie Tosh so you can hear about how they were able to, to turn that in our favor in North Carolina. OK, excellent. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. This is our general contact information here at Advocate Capital. We appreciate your attendance today. David, Kyle, thank you so much again for sharing a, a wealth of information. We covered a number of topics, some in uh, a lot of detail. So thank you again for being here. We appreciate the important work you do and keep it up because it doesn't sound like it's getting better anytime soon. I don't think so, Donna. I'm grateful for for that uh, for, for this opportunity. I love talking about this, and and we need more good people in this fight. So happy to talk anytime about it. Awesome, David. Thank you so much. Thank you.